Hi, my name is Jen Guile, and I'm here to demonstrate the third of our Microservices March hands-on labs on protecting Kubernetes apps from SQL injection. In this lab, we're going to deploy a cluster, a Minikube cluster, and a simple but vulnerable app. We'll then hack that app, and then I'll demonstrate two different ways you can filter traffic in order to prevent uh, this specific attack from being executed. One will be using Nginx open source as a sidecar, and the other will be using Nginx ingress controller, also the open source version. So I'm going to begin by creating my cluster. Again, it's Minikube. And while we're waiting for that to spin up, I will create my app deployment. Now, this app deployment is going to include two uh, microservices. One of the microservices is a Maria database, and the second is a PHP app that um, calls over to that database in order to serve up information on a website. So here's our deployment. Uh, the image is hosted uh, by F5 Dev Central account. So that's free if you want to do it outside of our uh, Instruct Lab. And you can see in the deployment, we have our PHP app in here and our Maria database. So I'm going to go ahead and save it. And it looks like Minikube is up. So I will deploy. It's created. And I'll use kubectl get pods to see if it's spun up yet. It is not, but that's OK. Um, it should be available within the next uh, 30 to 40 seconds. So once the app is spun up, what you'll get is what looks very much like a simple um, web marketplace where you have listings with information and clickable links. So let's see, is it up? Almost there. It looks like the database is up and running, one out of one ready, and the um, app itself is not quite there yet. And now they're both up and running. So now I should be able to refresh my app and interact with it. So that is the end of this first challenge. Okay, welcome to the second part of our uh, lab. In this part, we're gonna hack our app. So in order to do that, I need to open it up in a separate window. Um, this wouldn't be something you need to do if you're doing it in your own environment, but because I'm doing it in this browser-based version, uh, I need it open in a new tab so I can see the URL. So here's our URL. If we switch over to a product, what we can see is we end up with um, a product subcategory, and then we have a number here. And if I go to the next product, we have another number. So hmm, I wonder, could this number be a product ID that corresponds to the database on the back end? And so what I'll be doing is investigating what happens if I manipulate this, um, will I be able to get some information out of it? Now, ideally, if the app is properly architected, um, all of that information will be sanitized when it's submitted into the browser, and I'm not going to be able to get something back that I shouldn't have access to. But I think, as you suspect as you're watching, that's not going to be the case. So the first thing I'm going to do is just simply um, change the ending. I could change it to anything here. Uh, I'm going to add a minus before the one. And what I get is invalid product ID. Uh, again, this should not be what I get if it's properly architected. So this gives me an idea that maybe I can mess with the app a little bit. So I'm going to come back over here just for the visual purpose. We've inspected the URL. So what we're going to assume here, because we can manipulate that URL and obtain a result that is not ideally what we would want, in all likelihood the information is not escaped, that we're going to assume that there is some kind of a database query available, like this one here, where we would be able to insert some malicious code. And so we can replace that one right here with minus one. You'll notice it's followed by a parentheses. And then we can insert our malicious query in the middle and then cap it off with a double slash. So what that will do is it'll discard anything after the double slash. So as you can see in this example, right here is the injection. So I'm going to give that a try. I'm going to add just a parenthesis after this and see what happens. 
We'll enlarge this so it's easier to read. So it says, uncaught my SQL SQL exception. You have an error in your SQL syntax. Check the manual that corresponds to your Marina database server from the right syntax and so on. So again, this is information that you would not want the standard um, customer to have access to. None of this should be available uh, outside your organization. So me, the hacker, this tells me, okay, I'm on the right track here. I wonder what else I can get. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna try ordering it by um, the ID. So what we'll be doing is we have this minus one parenthesis, and then in between our uh, parenthesis and our double slashes, it'll be order one or one order by ID description. So I'm going to take this, I'm gonna put it right here. And I was able to force the database to order itself. And so this is the last item in the database. So this is telling me I am able to manipulate it. So far, I've done nothing um, harmful. But now I am going to try to obtain some information because this product ID, not super useful as a hacker. But what would be useful to me is if I can obtain some sensitive information that I could use to exploit um, the organization, for example. What if I could get my hands on a password? So what I'm gonna be doing next is assuming that there's a user's table. And if I insert union before select, what that does is it forces uh, two separate tables to join. And so what I wanna be doing is joining the product ID table with the user's table so that I can then pull information in and see what I get. So I'm gonna try Changing again. Let's see what it says. Uncaught my SQL exception. The used select statements have a different number of columns. So what this tells me, those two tables that we forced together have two um, different numbers of columns. The product ID table may have, let's say, two columns. And we don't know how many columns the user ID, uh, the user table has. And so what we need to do from here is start guessing how many columns could be in that other table because we want to force them together so that it'll provide us with information. And so what I'm going to be doing is starting with just a single additional column. So I'm replacing it here with the same beginning minus one parenthesis, uh, minus one quote union, which is forcing those together select from users and I'm uh, select password from users one column. So I'm going to see if that gets me what I want. No, it didn't. So that tells me it's still off on the number of columns. So I'm going to try it with two columns. So the only difference here from the last one is that it's password, password, and two columns. OK, same error message. I'm going to skip all the way down to five columns. So password, 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 password from users, five columns. Ooh, I got a password. So I don't have the username that this corresponds to. What would I be able to do to get that? Now that I know there are five columns, uh, logically, there's probably also a username that goes along with this password. And so what I'm going to do is now see if I can force it to retrieve both the username and the password. So in this new query, I have username, username, password, password, username from users. And that was successful. I have managed to obtain a username and a password. And so now I could use this to log into the database and retrieve who knows what. So this is great news for me as the hacker, but this is bad news if your organization uh, has this type of vulnerability. So again, the ideal would be that the app is architected to prevent this type of um, attack. However, there are things that you can do with your Kubernetes networking traffic management tools to also mitigate these vulnerabilities in the event that an app has not been properly architected. And that's what I'm going to show you next. 
Now we're in our third challenge where I'm going to be using Nginx open source as a sidecar to filter the traffic um, to reject this type of attack that I've demonstrated. Now I wanna be clear before I do this, that while this is a way um, that you can filter this traffic and it definitely does work, it's not necessarily scalable. And so I'm doing this for demonstration purposes as opposed to a recommendation that this is how you filter this traffic. So we'll begin, uh, my app is already open by creating a sidecar. So let's take a look at the deployment here for Nginx open source. A lot of this is gonna look really similar. Again, same image. Right here, we've popped in the sidecar. And then down here, we've instructed the sidecar what to do. So you'll notice in the Nginx config, it is saying uh, if it picks up union or select deny all. So I'll save that and kubectl apply to see if it um, makes a difference. Okay, that is all configured. I'm gonna come back over here, hit refresh and look at that. It is not happy. Let's try this again. Oops. Here's our union attack. So we have a 403 forbidden. It didn't work. Moving on, I'm gonna show you how to do this with an ingress controller. In the last section, I showed you how to filter traffic on the app itself. So imagine if this was your app, you'd have a little sidecar right here that's filtering traffic. Um, it's not a scalable way to do this. It can be error prone and it can be resource intensive if you're just deploying individual sidecars. And so there are some alternatives to this uh, one would be using the ingress controller to filter all traffic coming in and out. Now the ingress controller by itself uh, is probably not adequate to stop all attacks. And you would also wanna be relying on a web application firewall and probably some DDoS protection, uh, which can with Nginx ingress controller be deployed on the point of ingress. Another alternative, perhaps depending on the complexity of your apps could be to use a service mesh but I am gonna demonstrate how to use Nginx ingress controller here. Again, this is the open source version. We'll go ahead and deploy it using Helm. And it is deployed. It is probably not up and running yet. Oh, no, it is, look at that. How fast was that? So we have our app, we have our database, and we have Nginx ingress controller as the third pod. I'm gonna create my ingress manifest that'll route traffic through the ingress controller and to the app. Hmm. There we go. So let's take a look at this example. It's a lot shorter than the sidecar version because it doesn't need to be applied directly to that specific app. It's applied to anything that's behind the app. So we have the same uh, order here to deny all if it has select or union. I'll save that and kubectl apply. And we are here. Now I'm gonna be testing the filter again. This time, because um, I'm using an ingress controller, I need a new URL. So here's our new URL. And I'm gonna take that same malicious SQL code. Let's see, we'll come in here to do it. Oops. There we go. And again, we got a 403 forbidden. So both the sidecar method and the ingress controller method are effective here in blocking this particular attack. Now, again, um, there's limits to what you can do with a tool that's not a web application firewall or a WAF. Uh, we've managed to get it, the ingress controller to act as a WAF-like tool in this circumstance. 
uh, but you do want to couple it with a real laugh. And that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you'd like to try out this uh, lab, make sure you're registered for Microservices March at nginx.com slash mm. And check out our live stream where we'll see our friends from Learn Kate's demonstrate it in real time.